Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark, everybody. This is going to be a pretty special episode. I have two guests this time, Dr. Paul Eubanks and Tanya Staggs. I'd like to thank you both for being here. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, Paul, since you got here first, why don't you start us off? All right. Yeah. So I'm uh, Paul Eubanks. I'm a, an associate professor of anthropology at Middle Tennessee State University. And I graduated from the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, in 2016. And uh, since I've been at MTSU, I've been doing the uh, Summer Archaeological Field School, where we try to go out and uh, excavate uh, at least once a year. All right, so Tanya, why don't you go next? Sure. Um, Paul, I didn't know that you are a University of Alabama graduate. <laughs> We may we Is, may no longer be able to have a working relationship. Okay, all right. That's, that's... I mean, here, uh, here in the southeast, that's enough. that's a contagious thing that we all have to live with. So, well, I'm a I'm a University of Tennessee graduate. So, you'll you'll notice I told you that virtually, not in person. <laughs> right, not in person. Um, so uh, my name is Tanya Staggs, and I'm the director of Historic Castellian Springs, which includes Cragfont, Winwood, and Hawthorne Hill. And those sites are actually all uh, Tennessee state-owned sites. They're located in Sumner County, Tennessee, which is not far outside of Nashville. We're about um, 40 minutes or so outside of Nashville. And um, the way our state historic sites work is uh, the sites are actually owned by the state, but uh, the state contracts with a nonprofit to manage those sites. And we're the nonprofit uh, Historic Castellian Springs. So I'm actually an employee of the nonprofit, not of the state. Uh, but of course, being state historic sites, we work closely uh, with the state. We also kind of share um, uh, management, I guess, of the mound site where Paul has his uh, has had the field school for a few years, um, and so uh, so that's how we kind of. Uh, came to work with Paul and um, our other three sites are all historic house museums. So there's kind of a, a difference there in that we have the mound site um, and then we have three uh, historic house museums that date from 1790s up to uh, 1830. So that leads us into what we're talking about today. We're talking about the Craig Font site in particular. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the history of that? Sure. So um, Craig Font was built sometime in the 1790s. We don't have an exact date. Uh, we do know it was completed in 1802. Uh, it is a really big, fancy limestone uh, house. So it's built out of limestone. Um, it was owned by the Winchesters. Uh, no relation to Winchester Rifles, but uh, James Winchester, he was a Rev War veteran, came to Middle Tennessee shortly after the war was over from Maryland. He was he was originally from Maryland and he had fought the entire American Revolution. Purchased a land grant, uh, started out with a fort on the property and then eventually uh, built his big fancy house. Uh, the house kind of sits right on top of a hill. Uh, there's bluffs around us, a creek right uh, next door. He also built a mill, uh, a grist mill, a distillery and a sawmill which were all fully operational uh, by about 1800. And um, so there's a, today we only have Cragfont itself. We don't have um, any other buildings. We basically, our historic structures at Cragfont are the house itself and we have a cemetery, uh, but all other buildings are gone. That distillery, uh, sawmill and grist mill are all gone and all the slave cabins are gone. So uh, Winchester, at the time of his death in 1826, he was enslaving uh, around 31 people. And um, we are lucky that we have some family accounts that tell us that there were slave cabins, kind of gives us a rough location of where those slave cabins were, and tells us that they were made of brick. So there were six brick slave cabins. We have a pretty good description of, of 
what those cabins entailed. Unfortunately, no size dimensions. Um, but also there were two log cabins that were left over from when there was a fort on the site and those um, were actually used as housing for the enslaved house workers. So the uh, enslaved domestic workers and those were a little bit closer to the house. And uh, so, you know, we have some idea maybe of where uh, the slave cabins were, uh, a general idea. Unfortunately, it seems that all of the cabins were torn down uh, prior to uh, any photography. So we think that the cabins were probably, uh, the Winchesters had to sell Craig Font in 1866. We think that the cabins were probably torn down not a whole lot longer after that because we do have photographs from like the early 1900s and there's there's none of those kind of outbuildings there uh, at that point in time. So that's a little bit of the history. Um, basically your historic, you know, your kind of standard historic house museum, uh, really rich white guy lived there, <laughs> you know, big family lived there. Uh, and of course, uh, there was a significant enslaved population there. Uh, to kind of give context, at the time of his death, Winchester was um, one of the largest slave owners in our county. Uh, so Sumner County, uh, kind of the average at that time, uh, slave owner enslaved probably around uh, three to seven people. Uh, so there's a only a, a about three or four uh, people who enslave over 20, and Winchester was one of those. Um, now, all of the enslaved workers at Cragfont, uh, we have them documented, luckily, from, well, I shouldn't say all, but all that were there at the time of his death are documented in the probate records. So we do have names. Uh, we have family relationships, which is really um, significant. And we do have um, their ages, so we can extrapolate a date of birth on that as well. Uh, so we have some pretty good information on the enslaved population. We've been able to trace a number of um, uh the enslaved population after emancipation. And we've also been able to link uh, some modern uh, folks to their ancestors who were enslaved at Cragfont. Um, so we are working hard to tell that story um, back around, just to give a little bit of context real quick, uh, around 2020, actually just before the pandemic, uh, the state wanted to merge our sites, Cragfont, Wynwood, Hawthorne Hill, and the management of the mound site. Previously, those sites had been managed separately, and they were kind of very, um, you know, they were kind of stuck in the model of uh, a historic house museum of like 40 years ago. And so there wasn't research being done or anything like that. So when I came on, which was just right before the pandemic, we had merged all the sites together, created a new organization to manage them. And one of the goals was to professionalize. So I was the first museum professional to work at Cragfont. Um, and now we have two museum professionals <laughs> working, working at Cragfont. Um, so because we were closed down uh, immediately after we made the merger, because it was literally right before COVID, we use that time to do a lot of research. And previously, the enslaved population at Cragfont had never really been spoken about. Um, and we found that we actually had a pretty good wealth of information. And so we wanted um, to bring those stories forward. And that's important to us. And Paul is a really important part of helping us do that and the work uh, that he's doing with archaeology. So I'll leave it off there uh, so Paul can talk a little bit more about what he does. All right, Paul. Um, so Tanya's talked about uh, the narrative of the enslaved population. Is that what you guys are trying to accomplish with the archaeology there, or do you have a separate goal in mind? Oh, yeah. So that's uh, that's the main goal is to try to find or one of the main goals is to try to find the uh, residences of the enslaved population. 
uh, who lived at Craig Fawn. Uh, we did, and and by we, I mean uh, Richard Grubb and Associates. I'm I'm not part of them, uh, <laughs> but we uh, we we contracted somebody to come out and do some GPR work at uh, Craig Font uh, last uh, the end of last year, in uh, an area where, uh, as as Tanya mentioned, we have some family accounts that you know we think maybe the the cabins were in that location, and then. Uh, maybe a month or two ago, we went out and did a little bit of ground truthing following the uh, the work of the GPR. So we didn't uh, we didn't find any conclusive evidence of there being residences with the with the GPR work. When we went back and did the ground truthing. There's uh, material remains that you would expect to find if there were brick cabins there. So you know, we found lots of brick, uh, ceramics, nails things of that nature. Uh, there are uh, a couple of cabins that uh, Tanya mentioned that were not made out of brick, and uh, we we didn't find those, uh, but we we have just barely started working at the site. So uh, hopefully with some, some future excavations, we'll be able to maybe see if we can pin down the location of at least some of those cabins here over the uh, coming years. So... Um... You've mentioned about what you have in mind as far as future work goes. What's your ultimate goal for what the archaeology at Craig Font will look like? Yeah, so we are we are just starting, but it's uh, you probably got this sense from uh, listening to Tanya. It's a it's a very cool site, and not a lot of archaeology has been done there, uh, especially as it relates to the uh, enslaved uh, community there. So. Uh, I'd I'd like to see. I mean, I'd I'd be happy with uh, at least several seasons of of excavation there. That way, we can maybe try to talk more about the archaeology and, and history of the of the site as a whole, uh, rather than just the uh, the uh, one building that we that we currently have. Yeah, and then when people like me show up with archaeology questions, you know, there's a more uh, I guess definitive answer. I guess, or a more uh, concrete answer, I suppose. Yeah, as uh, as concrete as archaeology can be. Yeah, and as anyone knows, doing archaeology in concrete isn't isn't fun. <laughs> that's that's my one joke for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we we hope to um well pa Paul um in the work that it, they did already, we hope to get at least an interpretive sign to kind of talk about some things um, and the, the general uh, knowledge that we have of the, the, where the slave cabins were. Um, but we hope that uh, if we can find a more definitive answer as to the location, we have a good enough description that we would like to recreate um, at least one of those cabins based on uh, the family description. And of course, whatever Paul and his team can find, uh, hopefully will help us do that. Um, and, you know, like Paul said, we just don't want to confine the story of um, the enslaved population there to the one structure we have, which is the historic uh, house. So we want to be able to expand that narrative uh, to include the property and their presence there. So I do have uh, one other question. Um, so a lot of archaeology now is focused on giving voices to descendant communities so their story can be told because, I mean, let's face it, their, their stories are left out of history a lot. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see the role of descendant communities um uh, being incorporated into what you're doing? Oh, that's a great question. We're actually, um, we've just started to try um, to reach out to the descendant communities. Um, so if if we have time, I, I would like to tell a really cool story um, about Craig Font. So um, when Craig Font was sold out of the Winchester family, that happens in 1866. So to give a little bit of context, um, by the time we enter the Civil War, um, Craig Font, uh, you have the matriarch of the Winchester family, who is Susan Winchester. She was in her 
late 80s at that point. She's living at Craigfont. Her youngest son is living there, his wife and their five children and about 25 enslaved workers were there as well. And um, so fast forward a little bit, uh, the youngest Winchester son, he goes off to fight in the Civil War. Uh, that leaves his wife and his mother, Susan, in charge of everything. Susan passes away in 1864. Uh, that now leaves her daughter-in-law in charge of everything. So shortly after Susan passes, this is a story that's been kind of handed down through the Winchester family. Shortly after Susan passes, her daughter-in-law, Malvina, wakes up one morning to kind of start her day, and she notices that the house is eerily quiet. And she notices that the chores that are usually done every morning have not been done yet. So she starts to kind of look around the house and notices that there's none of the enslaved workers are out and about doing their chores. So she goes down to the kitchen where the cook, whose name was Delphi, she had been there for a very long time. She was 60 years old. And she'd been the cook um, probably for about 40 years at that point. And so she comes to the kitchen, sure to find Delphi. Delphi's not there. Fire's out in the hearth. She looks out to the slave cabins, which Paul's trying to locate where those were, right? And she notices there's no smoke coming from the chimneys of the slave cabins. And she goes out, finds them all empty. And all of the enslaved workers, including Delphi, who is uh, a, a cook uh, there, she was about 60 at this time, had all left in the middle of the night and walked from Crag Font to a contraband camp that was in Gallatin. So Gallatin today is about 10 minutes drive uh, from us in Castilian Springs. None of those folks ever returned to Crag Font. Uh, and after the war, the, many of those people that have been enslaved at Cragfont created a community just about three and a half miles northeast of Cragfont that they named Kansas. And so Kansas is still a community today, and there are still descendants of uh, the people who were enslaved at Cragfont there. So we are, so all that is to come around and say that that amazing story um, of the enslaved workers at Craig Font taking uh, their future and their freedom in their own hands, um, we have this direct connection to a descendant community. And so we are uh, reaching out to them. We've already had one gentleman um, take us to kind of a hidden cemetery in Kansas that has some folks buried in it um, that were enslaved at Craig Font. Uh, but, you know, as you can imagine, uh, they've been left out of the story up until we started doing this. Um, so they haven't felt very welcome um, at our sites. And so we're working to try to heal that. And we hope that archaeology, like what we're doing, uh, working with Paul, will help us get there. So, but they'll be very important in this uh, moving forward. So we're uh, getting to the end of this episode. Uh, is there any uh, advice you would give for anybody who wants to get more involved in archaeology or their own history or anything along those lines? Um, I'll I'll cover the archaeology bit. So <laughs> if you if if you want to do archaeology and uh, well, if you're if you're in or near Middle Tennessee. Well, shoot, you don't have to be in or near Middle Tennessee. You can you can drive here if you want to. But uh, <laughs> every summer, uh, the university where I work, MTSU, we hold a series of public archaeology events. And we are not holding one at uh, Craig Font this year because we're not digging there. But there's a, uh, a mound site just down the road, not even a mile. And uh, we're going to be open to the public on June 1st and June 8th. Those are two Saturdays, so you can come out and visit us, and we'll we'll teach you how to dig and how to uh, screen for for artifacts. And oh, uh, I'll give you a free tour of the site too if I'm not too busy. So, Tanya, what advice would you have for folks that are interested in getting more involved? Well, I would just echo what Paul said. So uh, he um, 
they have the field school, you know, um, at the mound site and they open up um, on Saturdays, the two Saturdays that he mentioned. Um, you can follow us on social media. Uh, we have separate Instagram and Facebook pages for Cragfont and for Wynwood. So the mound site's a little bit closer to Wynwood and it's kind of um, more connected to the history at Wynwood, uh, which is one of our other uh, sites. So we post a lot about that. So if you want to follow us, you'll see us remind you that that is happening on those Saturdays. And it's a great chance to come out and see a site that is uh, not open to the public. Uh, learn about archaeology and um, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to do that at Craigmont too. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you both for joining me today. It has been an absolute pleasure having you both on the show. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that is going to do it here for us at Archaeology After Dark, everybody. Stay tuned for more.